Bilal Hafiz, the CEO and head of research over at Macro Hive. Let's start with let's start with that. Fifty basis point hikes for several meetings. I, you guys discuss this all the time at Macro Hive about how high the Fed ultimately is going to have to go. Where do you land at the moment? I mean, we're actually very aggressive. So we think at least uh, back to 5.25, which is where the Fed was before the global financial crisis. And we think there's a real possibility they could go to almost 8% based on the okay. Taylor rule. So it's, it's a very punchy view, I know. What were, so 8%, equate that into equities for me. That would be equities much, much lower in that, in that context. And, and, you know, equities in our view, a large part of what's, what's driven equities higher is lower interest rates since the global yep. financial crisis, but also if we do get interest rates up to 8%, that will crush earnings. And at the moment, yeah. equities are fairly optimistic on earnings. So your view is that the Fed is more worried about inflation and less about growth, so a recession is possible? Absolutely, Not, yeah. Almost probable in that yeah, kind of scenario. Yeah, almost probable in that out. scenario. I think with the scenario of raising rates to... Not, not just eight, but even four or five, that, that's recession territory in, in our view. And, and the reason we say this is that inflation is very high in the US. So even if inflation does fall, it could end up being four or five percent by the end of this year, inflation. And the Fed will need to raise rates a lot to get it down to two percent. And that's Do you the think challenge they're really going to go Fed. for two yeah, percent? I, I speak to a lot of people about this, and, and nobody seems to believe that the Fed, apart from Chris Waller apparently, it is, is, is targeting two percent. The Fed will be happy with three. 4% inflation. That's the balancing act. You, you get inflation down, you get it to a manageable level, but you don't crash the economy into a wall. I mean, it's obviously a delicate balance. I mean, I think in the end, a large part of it will be the political uh, response to inflation yep. at 3% three, or so. Uh, you know, will households still be complaining about inflation if inflation's at 3 So there's another headline crossed a little while ago. Joe Biden's going to meet with Fed Chair Jerome Powell Tuesday. So that could be an interesting meeting. How do you think that discussion will go? I, you, you just laid out a economy that's going to be hit and hit hard. If you're a politician, and I know Joe Biden's been calling for the fact that the Fed needs to do its job and get inflation down, do you really want that? How do you think that meeting's going to go? If you were a fly on the wall, what do you think will be discussed there? Well, I think the main focus there will be inflation. And if you look at political polling in the US, the biggest issue for the public is inflation much more so than fears about the job market and so on. So right. I think he will, uh, you know, encourage Powell to do something about inflation. The challenge here is that you have a supply shock going on as well. So the Fed only has a certain amount of control yep. in this context. Now, if the Fed is the only tool you have to bring inflation down, then that means they'll have to raise rates dramatically if Biden isn't doing anything else on the other side, on the supply side. Let's talk about the ECB a little bit. 8.7% print in Germany today. So you've got Inflation up here, 8.7, and you've got the ECB down here with a negative 50 depot rate. How quickly does that spread need to close? I think fairly quickly. I mean, the, what the ECB has been saying is that this is transitory. We've heard this before, you know, with the US. It's also saying that a large amount of this is related to commodities, so not, not necessarily outside of commodities. Now, the data we're seeing at the moment tells us that even the turning commodity-related inflation hasn't happened yet. So this was a month where inflation was supposed to come off a bit, but instead it's gone up a lot. So I think there's a huge amount of pressure by the ECB to do something. There still is this debate yeah. within the ECB on what to do here. I'm going to come back and we're going to talk more about this in the next block. China is the other question that we're watching so carefully today. Uh, a reopening potentially in Beijing, uh, a reopening potentially in Shanghai coming through this week. Is that good news or bad news? Because on the, on the good news side, it's going to potentially ease up supply chain stories and it's going to potentially provide a little bit more demand. But that demand story could be negative as well. Oil prices back up to 120, potentially going higher from here. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to say. Obviously, markets at the moment are taking it very positively because it's yep. the, you know, another bounce in, in Chinese demand. But for me, the larger question is how sustainable is this uh, yep. return, this, this lifting of the lockdown? Um, you know, will we have another lockdown in, in a few weeks or not? What we don't know is the level of vaccination amongst the elderly population in China. That data is not easily available. Uh, now, if the population isn't, the elderly population isn't highly vaccinated, then we know that there's a high probability of another lockdown if uh, COVID cases pick up again. So I'm a bit sort of cautious around this. Is that your facts. base case? Is that your base case that we will see a series of lockdowns, that this is not the sort of the ending of this process, that the, the economic impact is still not big enough for the Chinese authorities ultimately to back off zero COVID? It's, it's hard to tell. That's the issue here. And the, the problem here is not just about the economic fallout of this, is that can you accept... A, 
uh, you know, high level of deaths amongst the elderly population yeah. if they're not vaccinated. And so that's the issue here. It's more about deaths of the elderly more than anything else. But from an investment point of view, is this an entry point into China? Is this, if we see more stimulus, is that going to help that entry point as well? It's, it's interesting to see that the Chinese equities did well today, but not that well. And tech stocks in particular haven't done that well even on the back of that. I mean, we, we still have all the regulatory issues because it seems like even if there's some lightning regulation, ultimately the, the direction of travel is one of regulating the private sort of tech sector. The other issue is that the most common transmission mechanism for stimulus is the property sector. And we know the property sector is impaired in China right now. So there's only so much that you can get a boost from that side. So overall, my, I'm, I'm quite skeptical of this story. Near term, obviously, we could see somewhat some positive momentum. But bigger picture, I still think there's not enough from China to call this uh, the big... Uh, rally in, in markets. If the Fed's going to 8%, <laughs> how high does the ECB need to go? Well, much, much, much higher than what the market's pricing. I mean, it should go at least up to, say, 2 3% or so. Um, however, the challenge for the ECB is that they are very worried about the economic fallout from, um, from uh, the, the current sort of picture. So not, you know, unlike the US, Europe has much yep. more of an energy problem, and so they're trying to balance that out. And what's interesting with today's German uh, inflation numbers are that Germany, while they have incredibly high inflation, they aren't calling for dramatic hikes by the ECB. And that tells you that the hit to the industrial sector is something that's top of mind for, for the German economy. Do you think a 50 basis point hike is possible? Probable? I, I think it's possible. I'm not sure if it's probable, just because the ECB is very cautious in how they're framing everything. So for now, I think 25 is the most likely outcome, but you can't rule, rule it out. And how do you think, like, to, the, to the question of fragmentation, how do you think BTPs react? I presume there'd be a massive sell-off. Yeah, right? I think there, there'd be a, a big sell-off. Um, the issue at the moment is that uh, BTPs have sold off, but if you look at uh, their sell-off relative to bonds and to treasuries, it, it's kind of what you'd expect in, in some ways. Um, it hasn't uh, weakened a lot more than the beta would say relative to those markets. So we're not in panic stage right now, but I do think if we were to see 50, it would widen quite significantly. Can I, can I just take you to the UK, Bank of America, sure. and we were chuckling about this a little bit earlier on because there's been plenty of calls for sterling crises over the years. I think I've lived through many calls for it, but not many actual sterling crises, though I have lived through a few. So, so Bank of America is saying that investors should hedge for an existential sterling crisis as the British currency struggles see struggles usually associated with emerging markets. While not wishing to over-exaggerate GBP's predicament uh, as an end-of-day scenario, we are concerned that the increasing politicisation of the UK policy undermines the pound. Um, this is the kind of end of that quote. Um, basically, we've seen a significant headwind on the supply side, a sense that the BOE is losing control over its mandate. I've seen, I've seen these kinds of notes before. This time feels a little bit edgy for the UK, though. This, this time feels like it is actually sort of skirting on very, very thin ice. Skating, even. Yeah. Or even skirting. I think the UK does have these big challenges, but I would also say almost every other developed country also has the same issue. We talk about Germany and, yep. and Europe, the US as well. Everybody has incredibly high inflation. Everybody has these same problems. Everybody has this challenge that central banks have been late to, to react to, to this inflation. So for me, the issue here is not so much about the UK, but it's more about developing markets as a whole. At the moment, the way the UK is behaving is similar to the way Europe's behaving in the US. So it's not you know, too, too different. So I think uh, a sole focus on the UK may be somewhat myopic in the sense of you just have to look at the bigger picture. And overall, DM markets are seeing higher yeah. inflation than EM. The, the issue with the UK is, uh, and the, the Bank of America note addresses this, is that the UK is not prepared to talk about the supply side. We're not addressing, there doesn't seem to be much political narrative around Brexit, which is a kind of almost a sort of unspoken, uh, unspoken at the moment. I think we're probably all glad that we're not speaking about Brexit in the same way that we mm -hmm. were. But it has impacted the supply side. I'm starting to hear more and more calls for the fact that the UK, to your point you made earlier, does need significant supply side reform. And probably is at the, the kind of the forefront of, of needing that to happen and fairly soon. If it doesn't happen, what are the implications? No, I agree. I mean, for sure, there has to be something on the supply side. And I do agree the Brexit aspect is, is very important for the UK. And I think that inflation is higher than it otherwise would be without Brexit. On the supply side issue, I think that the whole world needs a supply side uh, you know, reboot. Yep. You know, Europe needs to wean itself off Russian energy. US needs to deal with uh, deglobalization. So this is not just, just a UK issue. Now, in terms of if the UK doesn't do these supply side reforms, then what that does mean is that U UK will have chronically higher inflation than, other, than yep. other, other countries. But the question is how much higher? And in general, say Europe, 
say, UK versus euro inflation before the global financial, uh, sorry, before COVID, UK in general had 1% or 2% higher inflation than the eurozone. Um, and, yep. you know, it didn't have a full on crisis uh, around that time either. So, so I'd, I'd, you know, I'd separate, you know, a chronic or, or persistently high inflation from a crisis type dynamic. It would be remiss, and I think I said this to you last time, um, of me not to sort of speak to you about what is happening with Bitcoin because you track it so carefully. <laughs> yeah. We seem to be quite range bound on Bitcoin, kind of circa 30,000 at the moment. I'm hearing a lot of calls to the downside, I'm hearing some calls to the upside. What is your best case right now? My overall case is bearish for, for Bitcoin. Um, in the end, it's highly correlated to equities. And equity, to some extent, have also been treading water. You know, S&P has been hovering around 4,000. Yep. We're, we're up towards 4,200 now. And, and Bitcoin has been doing, doing, doing the same as well. But more generally, crypto, I think, has benefited a lot from low interest rates, just like tech right. stocks yep. have. And so as we see interest rates go up, crypto will get hit quite hard. And I also think there's somewhat of a distinction that's starting to occur between Bitcoin and altcoins or Yep. other coins as well, where Bitcoin is viewed as more of a safe haven versus the other coins as well. So there's an interesting bifurcation that's also happening as well. How much damage has been done structurally to the market, though, by, by the, the failures of the stable coins? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, there's a lot, of, a lot of kind of tourists in, in, the, in the crypto market. There was a lot of talk about institutional money flowing into the crypto market. How put off has that kind of money been? As a result of what, uh, as a result of the turbulence that we've been seeing, I appreciate the correlation with other assets, but structurally things have changed within the market as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think there's, a, uh, you know, for me, I think the biggest shift has been more amongst the retail investors who who very are very sensitive to PNL, and many yep. of them just came in on the expectation of higher returns. The institutional side, I think, uh, ironically, has been less affected by the the sell-offs. Um, for them, there, there are other issues for them. You know, the regulatory backdrop, how is re regulation going to yep. change to allow them to adopt these, these markets? Um, so, so institutions, I think, are, are not necessarily as scared as you'll, you'll think. I think retail is, is the one that's really been affected by this. You say you're bearish. How bearish? Well, I think Bitcoin could easily go down towards 24, 25,000, you know, in the, in the next three to six months, it, in perhaps even lower as well. What will get it even lower? Uh, I've heard yeah. some people are talking about a kind of we, we could get back down to single digits, into like below the ten thousands, yeah. into like single. Yeah, I mean that's that's also possible. I think the, the the way that would happen is if we were to see much higher interest rates and a recession type dynamic. If that was to happen together, right. then that's very so. Very okay, bearish. so let, let's bring this all together. This whole yeah. conversation. You started off the conversation talking about eight percent interest rates in the United States. That would be stock significantly lower. Where would that put Bitcoin by extension? That would then put Bitcoin closer to you know the t eight nine thousand mark. You know at that stage, if we were to see this. Okay, <laughs> that's been, it's been yeah. an interesting conversation, yeah. Bilal. Thank you very much yeah. indeed, Bilal Hafiz, CEO and head of research over at Macro Hive.